Um, uh, so I'm a biologist with the National Park Service, and like a lot of agency biologists, I work in a range of different areas from wildlife monitoring to water rights. Um, one of the projects I've been involved with since the mid-90s has been collaborative research, monitoring, and management of the lowland leopard frog in the Saguaro National Park where I work. And because we've had two major fires in the park since 1996 in watersheds above frog populations, we've had an excellent opportunity to learn about the impact of fire on this species. So my, my main focus will be on fire and the lowland leopard frog, but I'll also be talking about Saguaro National Park and Sky Islands and the fire ecology of southern Arizona. The, the effect of large and severe fires on watersheds and aquatic habitat focus on, on lowland leopard frogs, but I'll also talk about some other uh, frogs in Arizona, like the Chiricahua leopard frog. And then finally, kind of um, talk about what actions we can take as land managers to create and sustain healthy forests and healthy populations of amphibians. So throughout this talk, I want to kind of emphasize taking the importance of the long view. Um, we can think of ecological change kind of in two ways. First, as a as time circle where we see natural cycles on a, a daily or yearly or a decadal um, scale, or as an arrow with directional change, like such as human-caused uh, climate change. So cycles involving saguaros, for example, at our park may be on the order of hundreds of years. And we don't want to panic when we see changes that are part of the natural cycle, but on the other hand, we don't want to sit idly by while some kind of irreparable damage is occurring. So the challenge for us is trying to figure out the difference. I want to thank a, a number of people who have been involved in this project to bring expertise from many different agencies over the years. I particularly want to thank Mike Schreddle with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the, the Ron and Frog Coordinator, who contributed a lot of uh, slides and, and ideas. Uh, hopefully I'll represent them well today. And also Ann Eubert, uh, a geologist with the Arizona Geological Survey. So I want to introduce uh, Saguaro National Park. This is uh, the park on a um, cooler day than today. It's about going to be 106 today here, I think, uh, and then Sky Islands and, and fire. So the park is really an urban park. It's two districts on either side of the growing city of Tucson, Arizona. The western district is mostly desert and doesn't have aquatic uh, frogs that we know of. So I'll be focusing on the east or the Rincon Mountain District uh, east of Tucson. It's about a 100 square mile area to the east of Tucson. And the Rincons are one of these sky island mountain ranges in Arizona and New Mexico and Sonora, Mexico. Um, and uh, so a lot of the changes and, and ecosystems that we see in the, in the Rincons we see in these other uh, uh, sky islands like the Santa Rita's and the Whetstones and the Huachucas and the Chiricahuas. So these uh, have different ecological community as, as we go up from the desert or from the desert grasslands up to the tops of the mountains. At Saguaro we range from just under 3,000 feet to just under 9,000 feet in elevation. The frogs are generally concentrated down in the desert areas, but they're affected by things that happen up on the mountains above them. Some of the ecological communities we have here, and I'm going to just represent this in a really broad brush, we have uh, desert, Arizona Sonoran Desert, uh, upland, um, semi-desert grasslands, a variety of woodland types, and then uh, ponderosa pine and mixed conifer up at the top of the mountain. And then we also have riparian woodlands. These are uh, wetter areas that, that have trees like sycamores and, and walnuts and, and cottonwoods. And then a large number of uh, springs and seeps in the park, as well as these rock pools that are in streams that we call tanaha. These are often um, spring-fed, and they're really important uh, for important aquatic uh, habitat for many different kinds of wildlife, not just aquatic species, but mammals and birds that need to drink water during the dry months. So many of you uh, probably know a lot about fire in the southwest. Um, when, we, when we look at the different ecological communities in the park down in the desert, um, we have a lot of species that are not adapted to fire and can be killed by it, like saguaros. Um, I'm not sure what the fire return intervals for the desert are, but um, we are getting increasing numbers of fires in the desert, mostly because of exotic grasses like buffalo grass. Um, Semi-desert grasslands, uh, 35 to 6,000 feet with fire return intervals on the order of 10 to 15 years. And then um, woodlands and forests above that, pine oak forests, uh, return intervals of about 10 years. And then up at the very top of the mountain, um, we have ponderosa pine and mixed conifer, um, with again, with average fire return intervals uh, in the Sky Island region of about 10 years. 
This is a fire frequency map of, uh, of the Rincon Mountain District of Saguaro National Park. And um, if, you, if you look closely, the cooler colors are more frequent fires over the last, this is, it goes back about 75 years. Uh, obviously, those are concentrated at higher elevations up in mixed conifer and ponderosa pine. And then in, in just in the last few decades, we've, we've had um, fires down um, at lower elevations, even into the desert. Some of these are human-caused, and, and others are lightning-caused fires. Fires in the, in the southwest are, are usually off, often preceded by, by several years of wetter than normal conditions. Ignitions are generally May through August, really here, June and July in particular. And of course, you know, we need fires for healthy forests. Periodic fire um, you know, promotes nu nutrient recycling and increases our species richness and, and is really good for a lot of, uh, of plants and animals. For leopard frogs, um, fire and, and flooding and sediment is important because um, just for habitat purposes, um, a study that was done at the park a few years ago by Eric Wallace uh, at the U of A really showed how important it is to have this habitat heterogeneity and, and um, aquatic plants and, and roots, um, all, all of which are promoted by sediment um, that comes down after fires. We've seen um, changes in fire regimes in the southwest uh, in the past few decades in the paper by Westerling et al., uh, they found that these increases in large fires are occurring at a time with higher spring and summer um, temperatures. Uh, let's see if I can get my arrow working here uh, on this graph. And, and then also coinciding with earlier uh, spring snow melt, you see on the bottom graph here. And we, we're seeing, we, we, look, to me, it seems like we're seeing earlier snow melt in the Rincon Mountains as well. And so, of course, we've seen a lot of um, very large uh, recent fires in Arizona, the, the 2011 Wallow Fire and the Rodeo Cheskai uh, uh, fires were huge, and then the, the, the fires associated the Murphy and Monument Complex fires in southern Arizona. The Horseshoe Fire was a large fire, and, and so a lot of these really large fires um, have occurred um, in recent years. I want to uh, talk just a little bit about um, the impacts of, of, of large uh, fires, moderate to severe burns, um, and um, let's see if I can eliminate this arrow. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of the impacts that they have on watershed and, and aquatic habitats. So, with moderate severe burns, obviously we lose tree canopy, uh, leaf litter is removed, and so the, the properties of the soil change. Um, with, those, with those changes uh, during the rains that, that subsequently follow fires, runoff increases sometimes really dramatically up to 15 times due to this de decreased interception, um, and, and we see flooding, flooding down below. Uh, the excess runoff increases erosion on the hill slopes and in the channels, and here's some examples uh, from the 2010 uh, Schultz fire from Ann Uberg. And then um, with really intense events, uh, we get uh, floods and debris flows. Um, this is a debris flow in, in Marshall Canyon after the, uh, the 2011 Monument fire. And then ultimately, uh, further downstream, we can have impacts on aquatic wildlife habitats, such as the Tanahas that I mentioned earlier. And I'll be showing uh, several slides uh, that have these little circles. And these are basically repeat photos. Um, so uh, the circles are just to draw your eye to an area, uh, this, in this case, the rock in the center of the photo, uh, so you can see kind of the changes uh, over time. So I just want to run through some examples. I'm not a geomorphologist, but um, they're, 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 these examples are, can be really impressive. This is from the 2011 Horseshoe II fire in Chiricahua National Monument. And, and the watershed above the visitor center there burned about 45% of it with moderate to high severity. The flow with the rains increased about 300%. Uh, so what, what, what would have been a 33-year event, event uh, under normal conditions in August of 2012, reached the 100-year floodplain and brought down a lot of um, a lot of sediment and, and debris. These are some slides uh, from Ann Newberg with the Arizona Geological Survey. Um, so, following the 2011 Monument Fire down in the uh, Huachuca Mountains, 
Miller Canyon uh, receives about 1.64 inches of rain in an hour. So we really are thinking, talking about rain intensity here, which is just as important or more important than the total accumulation. So this would have been about a two-year event, um, but this, the runoff from this storm resulted in, in some really significant uh, debris flows and, and floods. And these are just some photographs I took off the web uh, showing uh, Miller Canyon uh, after that, that rain event on July 11th, before, excuse me, and then after, uh, so you can see the extent of this, of this flooding. Um, this is a slide from, uh, from, from Ann uh, just showing uh, she did research on the Schultz Fire up in northern Arizona 2010. You can see the erosion in the channels and then on the hill slopes. And of the material that comes down, and, and this varies, of course, um, with different fires, but uh, some percentage, about 25 percent, uh, is from hill slopes, and, and then about 75 percent is from, from channels. And again, I'm not going to go through the details of, of the debris flows, but these can be really impressive events um, that can dramatically change the landscape after a, a, a large, severe fire. Um, the recovery times, as you would expect, really vary a lot. Vegetation tends to recover pretty quickly within three to five years, and then the channels may take longer. These are some interesting photos just showing. This is the, cha the photograph on the left um, uh, was uh, a channel that was cut down after the 1994 rattlesnake fire in the Chiricahuas. By 2004, uh, it had recovered and wasn't nearly as deep, but the erosion was reinitiated um, after the um, the Horseshoe 2 fire in 2011, and, and now is really about 12 meters deep. So, so um, um, this may be maybe really changes that we'll we'll see on the landscape for a long time to come. And then again, just uh, downstream um, wildlife habitat. This is Rome the Romero Pools in the Catalina Mountains. Uh, that's actually me on a rock swing before the Aspen fire in 2003. That pool was you know eight to 12 feet deep and completely feel, filled with sediment after the Aspen fire. The sediments that fill these pools further downstream tend to be gravel and sand, um, coarse, coarse sediments, but not, not uh, boulders and things like that. OK, I want to turn now and talk about the uh, Lola leopard frog. Uh, Lithobate is a rana yavapayensis. This is a jumping frog. Um, it's got uh, webbed feet. So different from some of the other frogs that we see around. Um, these are some other uh, Arizona amphibians that I'm not going to talk about uh, very much. But um, species that, that are associated with streams like canyon tree frogs and some of the stream breeding toads, um, we would expect to see some of the same uh, effects of fire uh, on, on them that we see with leopard frogs. A lot of other amphibians, like the spadefoots and other toads, are, are kind of puddle breeders. Uh, or barking frogs or terrestrial frogs um, that probably are not as affected by fires. Um, sa tiger salamanders, uh, such as the native Sonoran tiger salamander, um, usually breed in um, cattle tanks, um, but, but could also be impacted in, in different ways by fires. Um, as, as some of you probably remember from uh, high school biology class, um, Ron, Ron and Frog Biology, the, the up, upper uh, left-hand corner here are these, uh, is an egg mass. Um, and then the, the eggs hatch. Um, we get small tadpoles. The tadpoles grow up and then eventually metamorphose into um, little, little frogs. Um, in the case of the little leopard frog, this takes a really long time. These aren't like uh, toads that, that can quickly grow into frogs in a few days. Um, they usually spend four to nine months uh, in the water before they metamorphose. So they really need um, perennial or semi-perennial water, and the, and the adult frogs need to, to keep their skin wet at all times. Amphibians have been declining um, uh, in different parts of the world over the last few decades for reasons that aren't completely clear. Um, we have also seen declines in Arizona. Uh, some of these declines are, are these rounded frogs, uh, like leopard frogs, and, and related species. Uh, two species I'm going to discuss later on today are the Tara humara frog, uh, which was uh, extirpated from its, its fairly small range in the United States um, and has been re reintroduced. And then the Chiricahua leopard frog, which is a related species to the lowland leopard frog and is listed as threatened. 
and occurs in, in southern and, and uh, northern Arizona. And then the lone leopard frog, which is not um, a, a federally listed species at all. Um, some of this work is hoping that we can keep it that way. It's a, it's a sensitive species. Lone leopard frogs are found um, throughout um, uh, Arizona below the rim. Um, uh, there are populations in the outskirts of Tucson and Phoenix and, and southern Arizona. It uh, has been declining throughout its range, uh, which, which goes into California, New Mexico, and Nevada, uh, and, and seems to be declining within its range in Arizona as well. Um, some of the causal factors for this may be uh, disease, in particular the chytrid fungal disease, also known as BD, which is affecting frog populations around the world as well as in Arizona. Also, uh, Predators, non-native predators uh, such as crayfish and American bullfrogs and, and large fish. And then a, a big factor is, is habitat loss. This photo um, at the bottom shows the Santa Cruz River uh, in downtown Tucson. This photo was taken about 100 years ago, and, and that was leopard frog habitat at that time. And, and if you've been to downtown Tucson, Uh, this map uh, shows um, the Tucson area and just some of the extirpated uh, populations um, that were down on the valley floor associated with the, the Santa Cruz and its uh, major tributaries like the Rito, but no longer occur. Where we cur currently find lowland leopard frogs uh, in Suara National Park uh, are in um, streams such as Rincon Creek, which are at, at, at lower elevations and, and lower slopes. And then in rock pools are tanahas that are found in uh, streams going up into the mountains. Again, it's primarily a desert frog. It gets into, up into semi-desert grassland and, and woodlands at times. We've been monitoring our populations of uh, low leopard frogs in the park since 1996. These are, um, these are visual encounter surveys. Um, they're spread out throughout the park. Um, we don't typically handle frogs. We, we go out, we use binoculars. Um, and we count them, uh, we count juveniles and tadpoles as well. Um, twice since 1996, we've, we've gone out and done uh, pretty complete inventories of, of all the streams in the park, the major streams, looking for leopard frogs, also looking for exotic plants. The, the little ye uh, uh, yellow dots on this map are actually exotic plant locations, uh, just to get a sense of how frogs are distributed uh, throughout the park. And then um, uh, in, in 12 uh, selected canyons that have um, uh, what seems to be good habitat for lowland leopard frogs, we've, uh, con we conduct surveys twice a year uh, during the dry months in June and then again in October. So if you just click at the uh, upper part, um, uh, the tab that says part two, we'll jump into part two. There we go. Okay. Okay, so if on each survey, we use a guide to find the pools in each stream with uh, coordinates and photographs. We photograph and we record the status of water in each of, of the pools. Uh, we record other aquatic herpeta fauna that we see, mud turtles and tree frogs and toads and garter snakes. Um, and I, I'm not going to go deeply into the details uh, of this monitoring. Um, Bob Steidel and Aaron Zoster are, are working on a paper on this uh, right now. But um, just to, to show a, f a few patterns, um, so this, this upper graph is adults. This is the average number of frogs seen on surveys um, between 1996 uh, and, and 2011. And you can see sometimes there are uh, highs where we see you know, between 15 and, and 40 adults per survey. And then other times there are lows where we might uh, not see any or very few adults um, per survey. And we see similar patterns um, with the other uh, with juveniles and, and tadpoles, although at, a, at a slightly different um, times. Um, this this um, this slide is just a map of the park that kind of shows occupancy, naive occupancy. By that we mean just the places where we have observed leopard frogs on surveys over the years. All of the black pools are are Tanahas where we've never observed a leopard frog. All of the green pools are pools where we've observed at least uh, one, one frog of some stage at some period during, some, at some survey during the period from 1996 to 2011. 
And then the red uh, pools are, are pools where we've seen leopard frogs uh, in every year since 1996. So the frogs have the capacity to really uh, expand outward on the landscape during wet years, and then they really depend on these, um, some of the more perennial pools to, to survive in during really dry periods. If we, we look at that, this, even on a stream scale, um, this graph just shows the number of streams that are where we observe frogs um, over the years uh, in terms of percentage, so the percentage of streams that are occupied by frogs. And so they, that ranges from during some drought periods, uh, only 40% of the streams uh, can we find frogs out there uh, in some years, whereas in other years, uh, typically associated with high precipitation, 100% uh, of the streams are occupied by leopard frogs. And um, as I said, these, these lows and highs tend to be associated with highs and lows of precipitation. So for example, we had a pretty extended drought uh, from 2003 until early, until mid-2006. And during that period, um, we saw a real drop in, in the uh, number of pools and streams that was occupied by by leopard frogs. And again, these, uh, this graph just is a slightly different way of expressing this. Juvenile abundance and occupancy is correlated with the number of pools that contain water, as you would expect in a, in a particular year. Um, and then adult occupancy and abundance are positively correlated with pools that contain water in the previous year. So good rainy years, we tend to get a lot of uh, reproduction and, and tadpoles. And then the following year, we have a large crop of adults. The water in the, in the pools is not always direct, directly related to rain. And so this is where we get into fire effects. Um, this is a Tanaha showing uh, that's been filled with uh, sediment after a fire. So I just want to talk about some examples. Um, I'm first going to talk about the Box Canyon fire, uh, which occurred in the park uh, in 1999, burned about 6,500 acres. This was primarily in um, woodlands and grasslands. Um, it burned uh, in a mosaic. There was areas that didn't burn. There were low severity, moderate, and high severity areas. Um, it was the, the fire occurred right above the uh, Loma Verde Canyon. About 68% of the canyon burned during this fire, and uh, this is what the this is what one pool looked like um, prior to the fire. You can see this uh, white rock in the center. Um, that I'm going to show in the next few slides. After the fire ended, um, we got the first summer rains um, at the beginning of July. That brought down a, a lot of ash that, that filled the pools. The water turned black, and so the water temperatures actually um, became very hot, um, 35 to 36 degrees Celsius, and uh, a tadpole mortality, but not mortality of adult um, frogs. Um, we had a large rain on July 15th. Um, we didn't have a, a weather station there, but it was between one and, and three inches of rain. And that brought down a, a big load of sediment and completely filled this pool and all of the pools in the upper part of the drainage with uh, this gravel and sand. Um, in the lower part of the drainage, that, that, that rain event did not fill the pools. Um, in 1999, but rain that we later received in, in, in the winter of 2000 did fill the pools. And so gradually, the sediment pulse moved down and eventually filled all of the, the, the leopard frog habitat in this canyon. So this graph just kind of shows the percentage of pools um, in Loma Verde in red that contained water during our frog surveys from 1996 to 2010. And as you can see, kind of prior to the fire, um, that was pretty variable. Uh, after the fire, um, in June of 2002, literally all of the pools went dry. And so the, the amount of uh, pools that had water was much more variable after the fire um, and often became pretty low, went dry again in 2006. Um, and then since then, the, the amount of water has slowly started to recover, the, the number of pools that have water. And you can see from these reference canyons that the, the pools in other canyons, um, many of them did go dry during droughts, but not all of them. 
So again, in, in June of 2002, all of the pools uh, filled, filled with sediment and the last leopard frogs in this canyon died. Um, this again just shows the count data um, of adult and juvenile frogs prior to um, and then after uh, the Box Canyon fire. So the frogs, uh, the, the, the numbers dropped after the fire, but they hung on until um, the spring of 2002 when they, when they disappeared. We continued to do surveys um, in the canyon, and then about five years later they did return. Uh, the numbers were lower, um, and then we went into a dry period a couple of years ago, and um, the frogs again seemed to have, have disappeared from that canyon. Um, another example I want to show from the park, this is the Helens II fire from 2003. This fire burned uh, 3,600 acres. Uh, it burned at higher elevations up in, uh, primarily in, in uh, mixed conifer and ponderosa pine forests. Um, this is the perimeter of the fire here. Um, and this fire, we, we actually have, have uh, John Parker from the USGS uh, was doing a study of, of fire effects on leopard frogs at the time of this fire, and so we know qu quite a bit about this fire and, and how it affected um, leopard frogs and their habitat in Joaquin Canyon um, below the fire. This other fire here is the Chiva fire from 1989. Uh, so these are some of John's photos showing just uh, uh, sheet wash erosion and uh, uh, overbank deposits from higher up in uh, Joaquin Canyon. And then these are just some repeat photographs of, of a pool. This is a pool uh, kind of midway down the canyon. This is before the fire on the left, upper left. Um, the ash flows uh, on the upper right. And then, um, and then the sediment worked its way down and filled that pool with sediment um, about a year later. Um, we were also monitoring leopard frogs. Um, the fire, uh, again, was in 2003. Um, the population of the, we, we, we saw no leopard frogs um, starting um, in 2005 for three surveys, and then uh, a, a, a few a few frogs, um, and then um, in 2010 we didn't see any frogs after that. So again, these are raw count data. There, um, we, we I want to I want to be cautious with this. There are other factors that could be impacting these frogs, but but the pools filled with sediment and uh, the frog habitat was, was gone there for, for quite a while. So a question is sort of, sort of how long does sediment persist in these, in these uh, systems? Um, what we're finding is that, for short, that it persists for shorter durations in pools that are in high energy areas, so smaller pools in particular. So this series of, of photos from 2001 after the 1999 um, Box Canyon fire on the left to 2013, same uh, pool on the right. So um, by 2013, excuse me, most of the sediment had had been washed out of this pool. This sequence of this is the photo I showed a minute ago from Joaquin Canyon. This is uh, 2005. Um, by 2010, we were starting to see the amount of sediment in this pool decrease, and by 2012, uh, it had pretty much washed washed out. Um, on the other hand, uh, in, in um, pools that are larger, uh, in lower energy areas, um, it, it may take many years for the sediment to move out. So this pool is a, a, a this is actually the 1989 Chiva fire. This is a, a pool in Wild Horse Canyon um, before the fire in 1988 on the left. And then in 2007, so um, almost 20 years after the fire, there's still a lot, there's a lot of sediment there. You can see this. This red box represents the same area on the rock. And in 2012, so now we're 24 years after the fire, there's still quite a bit of sediment in this pool, although leopard frogs have returned there and are, are reproducing there. This pool, this pool is, I'm not going to really talk about fish in this talk, but this pool did have um, a Gila top minnow in it before the, the Chiba fire in 1989, and, and they were extirpated after the fire. Um, and again, just another example, this was the uh, pool that I showed earlier um, from the uh, Box Canyon fire in Loma Verde. And so 2011, the fire was in 1999. Um, there's still um, a fair amount of sediment in this pool. 
So again, this is a, a, a lower energy area, and this, this watershed is, is, is smaller and less steep than some of the other watersheds we've been looking at. Um, after the um, Helens II fire, we felt that we really needed to get uh, more quantification of the sediment in these pools, so we started doing surveys of the Tanahas using survey equipment. And we can express these data kind of visually um, using a program called SURFER. So this upper left-hand um, um, graphic shows the bedrock contours of this small pool. Uh, on the upper right um, was the 2005 sediment contour, so it about, had about 42% uh, volume of sediment, 79% uh, volume in 2007, and in 2010 about 33% volume of sediment. If we, um, if we put all these together on a graph, this is a really busy graph and it doesn't include any error bars, but the variability is high. Um, we can look at kind of the, the long-term trends in sedimentation uh, in different canyons uh, in Saguaro National Park. So I want to just kind of simplify this a little bit. So the upper green line here is the um, Loma Verde, 68% uh, of the watershed was burned in 1999. And so more than 60%, between 60 and 70% volume of sediment in the Tanahas. In contrast, this is the Chiminea Canyon, um, much smaller area burned in miscellaneous fires and, and much smaller sediment load. It's not always um, this straightforward. These two, two canyons, Rincon and Madrona, um, had not burned since uh, the 1994 um, Rincon fire. Uh, we had a big flood in July of 2006, and uh, some of the pools uh, got quite a bit of sediment in them after that flood, um, and then the sediment uh, washed out um, a few years later. And then finally, this is Box Canyon itself, which was um, had 61% burned uh, during the Box Canyon fire, and yet had less than 30% uh, sediment volume at any time. Um, John Parker thinks, and, and I agree, that this canyon is different. It's, it's uh, smaller and steeper. There's more bedrock exposed. And so it just did not have the, the sediment load that, um, for example, Loma Verde did, which was burned during the same fire. And again, I just want to just, you know, reiterate that, um, that, that this, these flooding and fire and frogs um, can be really good in the long run for leopard frogs. Um, the sediment promotes vegetation, which is which is good for the frogs. It's really kind of an issue of scale. You know, how how many canyons burn, how severely, and at, and at what times. If we if we take the the, the longer view of these monitoring data, um, we can see it. again. I just I showed this slide earlier at the top. There there really hasn't been any discernible trend in. Um, in, a, in abundance or occupancy for this, this species in the park over the last 17 years or so. Um, and the frogs are distributed a, across the landscape uh, in a way that does seem to give them some resilience to uh, individual fires that may be taking place in certain watersheds. I want to just talk uh, briefly about uh, fire effects on some other frog species in Arizona. Um, the Chiricahua leopard frog, which is a threatened species, and as I mentioned, the Tauramara frog, which has been extirpated from Arizona and reintroduced. Um, the Chiricahua leopard frog uh, occupies a number of different types of habitats in southern Arizona. Uh, it also occurs in northern Arizona. Cienegas, um, sorry, uh, Cienegas, um, um, cattle tanks, uh, stream pools. Typically, it's at higher elevations than the lolo leopard frog. Um, uh, fire has impacted uh, this species uh, in a number of ways. Um, these are just some examples. The 1977 car fire in the Huachucas led to some major reductions in canyon habitat and, and extirpated some populations. The 1990 dude fire uh, just below the Mogollon Rim uh, in fact affected uh, some of the few remaining populations there. They've since been reintroduced. The rattlesnake fire in 1994, um, major sedimentation in Rucker and Pinery Canyons and was a factor in their extirpation from um, the Chiricahuas. <clears throat> and then the, the Wall fire uh, affected stream habitats in, in the White Mountains, and, and the Monument fire affected um, the population in Miller in the Huachucas. These um, 
these uh, two photos just show on the left the um, the, the ponds in Miller Canyon. Um, these are they're human influenced, um, and then and then what happened to them after the the monument fire in uh, in 2011. Um, the Tyre Mara frog um, was limited in its distribution in Arizona historically to um, the Santa Rita's and, and a few populations um, in south, extreme southeastern Arizona. Their typical habitat are um, kind of bedrock pools, plunge pools. Um, they were extirpated um, a couple of decades ago from, from Arizona. They were reintroduced into Big Casablanca Canyon, Canyon excuse me, in the Santa Rita's in 2004. Um, and again, this is a slide from uh, Mike Schroeder with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, just showing some of the, the releases uh, in, 19, in 2004 and 2005. Um, so the, the population was reproducing and, and doing well there. Um, in 2005, the Florida Canyon burned about 23,000 acres in the Santa Rita Mountains. It, it only burned a small portion of the, of the watershed um, and at pretty high elevations. Um, and, and in the initial uh, rains after the, the fire, there wasn't too many effects on the, on the frogs. Um, but a large storm in 2006 did bring down a, a large amount of sediment that killed and kind of concentrated the frogs and essentially led to the extir extirpation of that population. This is uh, just a pool in October 2005 before the sedimentation and then um, on the right-hand side after the sediment um, that was in that, in that, that um, area where they were reintroduced. The, the current status, the, the habitat in, in Big uh, Casablanca Canyon seems to be recovering well. It's a, a large canyon. The sediment seems to be flushing out. And the uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department and its uh, partners is um, planning uh, new um, translocations into, into that area um, this year. So I want to just close by talking a little bit about kind of mitigations, um, what we can do uh, as land managers to, um, to you know, try to, try to maintain healthy populations of, of uh, frogs on the landscape, which I think are tied, obviously, with healthy forests. Um, so I'm going to briefly run through some of the types of actions that we can take, uh, ranging from preventing post-fire uh, erosion to, 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 no, to no action. So some of the, the measures um, that are often used to, present, to prevent um, erosion after, after these big fires, um, uh, they range widely, log erosion barriers, uh, straw barriers, mulching of various kinds. And there's been some research on the effectiveness of, of these different treatments. And, and I think it's fair to say that in the, in the right situations, in the right amount of rainfall, they can, they can be effective. But for some of the really big events that I've shown uh, images of today, um, they're, they're probably not going to be effective. So they, they have the potential to be effective, um, but they're not a panacea, and, and I'm not sure that they would have presented, prevented some of, some of the uh, damage to frog habitat that we've seen, especially with really severe fires. Uh, another um, alternative is, is habitat restoration. Um, so we can, we can dig out Tanahas in Saguaro National Park that are filled with sediment, uh, and we have done that on an experimental basis to see whether that could be um, a good alternative here are volunteers digging out um, a Tanaha in 2005. Um, I seem to have lost control of the. Okay, okay let me see here. Uh, yep, now we got it. Thank you. So I, I think um, the. In, in general, I don't, I don't think these treatments have been effective. Uh, the pool here on the, on the right, the photo on the right shows the pool as it is today. Um, there's, there's still quite a bit of sediment in there. So after we've, we've, we've actually excavated this pool three times, and each time afterwards it would fill with sediment again. But it was effective in kind of buying time for the frogs, and when the frogs returned to um, pools that we hadn't excavated in this drainage, they, they eventually moved down into this pool and um, successfully, we had some successful metamorphosis. Um, so uh, I think this, this technique can be helpful and, and valuable uh, in particular circumstances, but, but there's a need to maintain it and, and do this on a regular basis. Um, 
Habitat restoration uh, can be really successful. Uh, in some cases, this is uh, uh, redigging the ponds uh, in Miller Canyon uh, following the, the 2011 um, monument fire. Um, and these are above the, 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 the lower part of the floodplain and uh, are likely to be successful. This was a project done, by, again, by Game and Fish and its partners. Um, Another thing that we can do for leopard frogs is, is salvage them after the fire and then um, raise them up in other places and then reintroduce them. This has been done successfully in Miller Canyon. Um, this was a project with the Game and Fish Department and Glendale Community College. I think the question, that the question, the types of questions that we have to ask when we when we're wondering whether we should do salvage and reintroduction is, you know, is this risk spread out across the landscape? So is it? Do we need to do it? You know, what are the consequences if we don't do it? But if the, if the risk is great and the consequences are great, then, then this is an option that needs to be considered. Um, we've, we've kind of done something similar in Sawar National Park. We've had a project with our neighbors where they create backyard ponds, and then we introduce uh, lolo leopard frogs uh, in the form of tadpoles or eggs into those ponds. And the idea is to create um, stock that we can use uh, to, re to, to supplement populations in, in the park should, should we lose them. Uh, as a result of a fire or other consequences. Um, uh, so I think that this project has been successful for a number of reasons, um, including just getting the community involved with frog conservation. One area where it hasn't succeeded and that we didn't expect was that we've been getting bullfrogs into these ponds. It turns out that there are a lot more, even though we don't have bullfrogs in the park, there are a lot of bullfrogs out on the urban fringes of Pakistan and they've managed to find their way into the parks and, and eat the leopard frogs. So we've had to, ma had, a, had to have a higher level of maintenance than we expected when we started this project in 2005. And then finally, there are many actions that we can and should be taking um, before fires to maintain a healthy landscape, to reduce the, the size and intent and severity of fires, um, and that's probably the best way to reduce the impacts on watersheds and frogs. So we have a lot of tools for that, prescribed burns and, and natural fire, letting natural fire starts burn. Um, and in, in Saguaro, where we've had um, a number of smaller fires over the years, we've seen fewer impacts to, to leopard frogs. Uh, uh, some of the general concepts, I think, when we think about conservation of leopard frogs uh, and fire is really kind of understanding the threat uh, to the landscape at various scales. So the, the mountain, the, the stream scale, the pool scale, and then recognizing that different wetlands, whether they're, they're cattle tanks or, or stream pools, um, uh, are different. Understanding the uniqueness of the species, which in some cases is a, is a genetic question, uh, how genetically distinct is this particular population and, and how important is it to preserve. And then ultimately spreading the risk across the landscape so that rather than having all of our populations in fire-prone canyons, um, ensuring that we have populations that are uh, spread out in, in other areas. If the, if the risk is, is too clumped, then, then um, we can do a lot of things from a management point of view in terms of creating and managing um, refugia for them. And then finally, really considering the no action alternative, recognizing that the complexity and the natural cycles of these systems uh, are such that they may be able to heal on their own. So these are difficult decisions. and, and uh, and we just have to make them. Um, ultimately, it's a lot easier to manage for a healthy forest than to micromanage small populations of, of threatened species. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we don't always have that option. You know, managing national parks and forests and refuges is, is really a complex business. We have uh, fire regimes that are changing. We've got exotic species like buffalo grass that are coming in. We have climate change. Um, we have urban development. Um, and, the, and these also all, all make it very complex. Um, I, I just read um, a, an article on fire management, at Suar, uh, a chapter on fire management at Swar National Park by Stephen Pine that talks about this complexity. And one of his messages is that we, we have to be both prepared and, and, to, and lucky to be good man, land managers. So I guess this is my final slide, but if I had a final slide, another final slide, it would be we get back to the saguaro and, and, and the time circle slide that I showed at the beginning. And just to emphasize, there's really no easy way to make complex management decisions involving um, frogs and, and fire. Um, but having as much um, long-term information as we can gather in advance is, is always helpful. 
So again, this is my final slide, and so I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Well, that was a great presentation, Don. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, I'll unmute the line in a second. You can also type questions in the chat window in the lower left. I'll ask a quick one to, to kind of get started. Um, I may have missed it as you, throughout the presentation, but can you kind of highlight again or reiterate the um, link between fire severity and some of the, the um, sedimentation in the various canyons? Um, so obviously, different fires have, have different amounts of sedimentation based on the percentage burn, and I saw that in some of the graphs. But I was curious whether you built into some of those or other researchers built into some of that analysis, the fire severity. Yeah, other researchers have. I, I, don't, um, I don't have that information in front of me, but, but obviously there is a relationship between fire severity and, and watershed effects and downstream effects. Um, so, like some of the models that look at that, um, build build that into the model. Um, and um, so, again, I'm not a modeler or geomorphologist, so I I, I can't address that specifically um, in terms of data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I see. Um, let's see. Let me go ahead and unmute the line here. So feel free to speak up if you have a question. And and Liz Carver typed in a question. Um, let me see if I can get this right. It's it's asking about the relationship between fire and drought over the last couple of years. Don, do you want to talk briefly about that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think that, again, it's one of these interactions that, um, so the, the, the fire effects, so if, we, if we're getting sediment in, um, in pools that where leopard frogs occur, um, the, the, the drought effects are exacerbated um, by the sediment. So pools that, that might get very low but still contain water during a uh, really severe drought. Um, if they're half full of sediment, that, that water level is going to drop below the sediment level. And so the, the water is really no longer available to frogs. It, it is when it's sort of close to the surface, but once it really drops down, the, 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 the frog, especially the tadpoles, you know, they just can't survive. Um, and so the, the, there's an interaction between the drought and, and the sedimentation. So during wet years, the sedimentation is not that important, and that's why we can get frogs coming back into, into uh, canyons that have a lot of sediment um, because there's a lot of water. So, but as it starts to dry up, then, then the sediment really becomes a factor. Other questions out there? Hey, Don, this is Mike Shreddle. Hi, Mike. And hi. Um, and uh, you know, I, I really like uh, a lot of the general concepts um, that that you began to outline towards the end of your um, uh, talk. And uh, Ray Semlich um, at University of Missouri uh, has taken a similar approach, looking at the biological uh, side, natural history side of the neurons uh, from a recovery plan perspective. And have you thought about, uh, you know, just sort of a general writing a, a outlining those general concepts into sort of principles of, of uh, large landscape management of, of ranted frogs in the face of changing fire regimes in the southwest? Because I, I think, you know, I think there, it's a, a very neat idea. Yeah, it's a really great idea. And I, and I, yeah. I don't think I said this enough, but, I, you know, you and I have discussed this. And, and uh, yeah, I think it would be a really great thing to do. Um, I think you should take the lead on <laughs> I'd love to work with you on it because I think it's I think it's important, yeah. and I think again it's sort of we tend to make decisions as managers. Quite often we make them sort of spur of the moment. We got a fire, we got to do something with sure. us back and having kind of a general framework to guide us. And I think that's something that's really needed, especially that's specific to the Southwest because our our fire regimes here are different, and our and certainly our 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 waters are different. You know when we talk about yeah. A desert park where water is so precious and and so variable, um, even its presence is variable. Then, then we really need to we have a kind of a unique situation that you, you need needs a unique approach. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I numerous times as we were talking uh, prior to your presentation, uh, have been in a situation of uh, so you don't want to salvage, and and um, you know it, it's as you say by the time the fire is is burning. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that we're, we're talking about salvage, no salvage options when uh, there could be a, a long period of time when, when there were many other options 
uh, or, or just getting into the crisis of a fire where if you had a framework from which people could, could kind of methodically work through uh, some of the ideas that you brought up in your concepts of where the risk is and, and how the risk will affect both the natural history of the, of the animal as well as the um, hydrology and geomorphology of, of the systems that they're in. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, that's a great point. Other questions or comments? I guess at the risk of monopolizing, I'll, I'll um, ask another, and that is based on what you guys were just talking about, Don, can you talk a little bit about the decision-making around scrap fire and uh, use or, or um, allowing unplanned fires to continue to burn uh, in relation to frogs and how, you know, is there a feedback loop between the fire managers, hey, I want to do this prescribed burn, and the folks kind of in charge of uh, fraud management and conversations about when and how to do it? Yeah, yeah, definitely there's a feedback loop. I mean, I think we don't do enough prescribed burns, um, and, um, you know, I think that, that that's a way of, of reducing the, um, the amount of, of fuel out there and, and reducing the severity of these fires. So uh, it's, a, it's an important conversation to have, and it's also an important conversation that we have here when there is a, a fire and making a decision as to where to let it burn and, and not to let it burn. Um, because in areas where that haven't burned for a long time, that we know that the watershed impacts downstream are going to be pretty major. So, um, you know, that's a conversation. That's part of the conversation as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for... A lot of federally listed species, I mean, there, there does uh, exist sort of a framework, um, you know, Section 7, and, and the, um, even though the Section 7 for fires is done uh, after the fact, um, you know, it could, it could be data on frog locations and, and where the risk is uh, could, could be uh, uh, front-loaded into uh, fire management, uh, which, which could include uh, and definitely would include uh, prescribed fires. Yeah, and the other thing that I, I, I didn't mention in the talk, I, I meant to um, um, with the final slide, is that you know, the, there's also decisions made about where to put retardant, um, which, which has the potential to also affect frogs if it's dumped directly on them. So. And there are, other, there are other issues related to taking water from ponds and spreading, potentially spreading uh, hatred to, to populations where, that, where it doesn't exist. So there are, there are a lot of other issues that are, that are really worth having a conversation about. Well, we're, we're right about in an hour. So again, Don, I, I really want to thank you. I think this is an excellent, um, you had a lot of slides, and I was nervous early on that, that you'd have to rush through them, but it was a really gentle um, introduction for those of us who don't know much about frogs, and um, we really covered a lot of detail. Good. Um, we have time if you folks want to stick on the line and ask some other questions, but we understand if you have to drop off. Okay, yeah, I'll be here. Other comments or questions? Nice job, Don. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for all your help. Okay, maybe on that note, we, we will uh, we'll let everybody go. And, and again, thank you, Don. Yeah, one, one last thing I would just say is I do have, uh, you know, I didn't put references, obviously, in here. I do have references and, and papers that I can send to people if they're interested in particular aspects of, of this topic. I obviously covered a broad range of things here, and I can, I can provide um, further information if people just want to email me or give me a phone call. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Okay, and with that, I'll, I'll close off the webinar, and please do take a moment to uh, fill out the survey if you can. Thank you.